Chapter 24, Hematologic Emergencies At the end of this discussion, you should be able to discuss the composition and functions of blood's essential components, summarize the role of white blood cells in the normal inflammatory processes, define hemostasis and the mechanisms essential to its maintenance in the body, outline the steps in the primary survey and management of a patient with hematologic disorder, Summarize general emergency care for a patient with a hematologic disorder. Describe the pathophysiology, assessment, and management of sickle cell disease. Describe the three types of sickle cell disease. And outline the pathophysiology, assessment, and management of other common diseases and conditions of the blood that are covered on pages 1303 through 1307 of the JV Learning Book. Discuss the causes, symptoms, assessments, and management of blood transfusion complications. So what is hematology? Basically, hematology is the study of the blood. It addresses how the blood parts are involved in health and disease. The components of the blood include the red blood cells, the white blood cells, the platelets, and other proteins involved in the bleeding and clotting cascades. Within this you have what's called the hematopoietic system. The hematopoietic system includes organs and tissues involved in the production of blood components, primarily bone marrow, spleen, and lymph nodes. Many hematologic disorders refer to any disorders of the blood. Now, you also have hemolytic disorders, which are disease processes that cause the breakdown of red blood cells, and hemostatic disorders, which are bleeding and clotting abnormalities. You should have a basic understanding of the hematopoietic system and hematologic disorders and know how to respond to these kinds of emergencies appropriately. Blood is a connective tissue. Blood is composed of cells and cell fragments suspended in the plasma. Approximately 8% of the total body weight, which is around 5 to 6 liters, is uh, what makes up the blood. The primary functions of the blood, which you should know at this point, supply oxygen and nutrients to the cells, transport carbon dioxide and nitrogenous waste from tissues to lungs and kidneys, where waste are removed from the body, carry hormones from the endocrine glands to the target tissues, regulate body temperature, regulate pH through buffering components in the blood, keep fluid and electrolytes balanced through sodium and plasma proteins, regulate the immune system through the actions of the white blood cells and antibodies, and form clots through the action of platelets. 92% water and 8% of your various solutes, 55% of the total blood volume. Your formed elements, account for 45% of the total blood volume, and these include your red blood cells, your white blood cells, and your platelets. Your red blood cells are also called erythrocytes, your white blood cells are also called leukocytes, and your platelets are also called thrombocytes. Of these numbers, 99% of those are red blood cells. Eight percent of the total body weight again is the volume of, of blood. As you see on this slide here, you will note that there are different types of uh, leukocytes and erythrocytes. All for um, fighting infection with your leukocytes and for um, transporting oxygen and the clotting cascade. Production of the red blood cells occur within stem cells. Erythropoietin is what stimulates the red blood cells um, to begin to be produced. Production is stimulated by erythropoietin, which is a protein secreted by the kidneys in response to circulatory need. The red blood cells may take as long as five days to mature and have an average life of 120 days. Within the red blood cells, iron-rich hemoglobin carries oxygen to the tissues. Oxygen attached to hemoglobin gives blood its red color. There is the effect called the Bohr effect, 
when oxygen-rich red blood cells encounter an environment that contains higher concentrations of carbon dioxide, oxygen is released. Often you will hear of laboratory values being taken for somebody that is possibly anemic or hemorrhaging called an H and H, a hemoglobin and hematocrit. As you can tell by this table here, the numbers vary um, fairly significantly between males, females, and children as far as what's normal and what's not. Um, typically, uh, your H and H are good indicators to determine if someone is bleeding. Now, there are some things that affect the numbers, such as high altitude, uh, COPD, polycythemia, things such as that. Um, and then your thrombocytes are your platelets. Uh, thrombocytopenia is low uh, thrombocytes, which is caused by certain cancers or leukemias. Um, with high readings, you may have pulmonary embolism, uh, polycythemia, and other types of cancers. Your red blood cell count measures the number of red blood cells in a blood sample. The hemoglobin level identifies the amount of hemoglobin found within the red blood cells. Then hematocrit gives the overall proportion of red blood cells in the blood. Blood is considered balanced if the hemoglobin level is one-third the hematocrit level. Red blood cell count is one-third the hemoglobin level. White blood cells, or fighter cells, are larger than red blood cells. They provide immunity against foreign invaders, and they're derived from stem cells as well. There's several types, as we had noticed from the past table, that exist and perform a specific task to maintain the immune system. Certain disease processes are also specific to the differential white blood cells. Neutropenia is an abnormally low number of neutrophils, which make up the majority of the circulating white blood cells. Immune system responses can be categorized into humoral immunity and cell-mediated immunity. Humoral immunity refers to the secretion of antibodies called immunoglobulins within a, which recognize a specific antigen. In cell-mediated immunity, macrophages and T-cells attack and destroy pathogens or foreign substances. As you can see here, a white blood cell count and a differential. The differential refers to the different types of fields and sites that are uh, within the uh, subcategory of your white blood cells. The table shows white blood cell count and differential. Typically, when someone goes into, say, an urgent care or an emergency room, um, oftentimes they will do a, uh, a blood count to determine if they've got a bacterial infection um, to see if the number is high with white blood cell count, viral and bacterial infections. Uh, oftentimes, bacterial infections will make the white blood cell count go up even higher. Now, I would recommend that you do understand what each type of the... Um, cells do here. Your platelets are your smallest formed elements which clot the blood. They're responsible for hemostasis, which is a process that, that stops bleeding. Approximately two-thirds circulate through the blood. The rest are stored in the spleen. So initially, they will form a plug following the vascular injury. Clotting proteins then toughen and complete the blood clot. Thrombocytosis is the production of too many platelets, which can create thrombosis. Hemostasis is a process that allows the body to stop bleeding. It starts with a vascular spasm, coagulation, then platelet plugging. Clots are made up of fibrin. Following the injury, thrombin converts fibrinogen to fibrin, and the clotting process begins. Calcium acts as a binding agent and the clotting cascade is the process by which clotting factors work together to ultimately form fibrin. You do have some major players in the blood forming organs. Uh, your bone marrow, especially the bone marrow of your long bones, such as your humerus and your um, femur. The liver produces the clotting factors 
found in the blood, filters the blood, removes toxins, and is essential to normal metabolism and homeostasis, and it breaks down old red blood cells into bile. Your spleen is also vascular. It sits with lymphocyte production. It filters and breaks down red blood cells. We'll see this as an issue in one of our disease processes that we talk about a little bit later. And it helps provide homeostasis and infection control. So this is some of the major players in the anatomy and physiology of the hematology system. While this is not very in-depth with what we've discussed here, it is important to have a basic understanding as we move forward with our patient assessment and our disease process understanding.